Welcome back. I'm glad to see there are enough seats for everyone. Uh, however, next week, it being the pre-midterm extravaganza, uh, I have reserved GUIO 10. I'll send an email about it, but a little heads up. GUIO 10, which is much bigger, hopefully big enough. So just across the road. All right. Yes, I'm doing a massive review session on Tuesday. It's not just in GUIO. It's massive because it will be at least four hours long. It will consist of probably whatever I don't finish today, followed by a review of the rest of it in fast motion, followed by open-ended Q&A session. So you have to bring the questions, and I'll go over it until everyone is sick and tired of it and wants to go home or I fall asleep, whichever comes first. Uh, any other questions before I commence with section 3.2? Yeah. What time does it start and does the video get up? Uh, we're going to start at 7.30 as usual. Uh, the video will not be up in time for the midterm, I don't think, right? What, what time is the midterm on the Wednesday? 7.30 p.m. Oh, maybe we can make it up. up. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll, we'll work something out. Hopefully it will go up just enough time to watch it before the actual midterm starts. Any other questions? Yes. It's in GUIO 10, but I'm going to send an email about it. An email, and it's going to. I mean, I mean that's, that's where it is. But I'm also going to send an email about it. Any other questions? Can you ask a homework question? What is the homework? What section is the homework question on? 3.4. Uh, I'm going to cover 3.4. Are you going to be here for the whole time? Okay. Ask me then. Any other questions? All right, so the plan is I finished 3.1 last time after we did the quiz review. And I wanted to do 3.2, 3, and 4 at least, and maybe some of 5.1 if I have time. Otherwise, I'll mop up at the beginning next time before doing the full review. OK? All right, so last time we looked at some pretty important concepts. Um, just to remind you what those three concepts were, uh, Concept one was the idea of the span of a bunch of vectors. And just to remind you, that is the set of all linear combinations. Linear combinations of the vectors, the m vectors, which is also, more precisely, the set of all vectors of the form c1, v1, plus c2, v2, and so on, plus cm, vm, where c1 up to cm are any scalars, as in real numbers, as far as we're concerned, at this point. Okay, so you you try to flesh out. You're not just doing v1, you're doing all multiples of v1. You're not just doing v2, all multiples of v2. Plus all the combinations of v1 and v2 will form a plane unless v1 and v2 point in the same direction, in which case you still only get the line. And a third vector could give you a space or it could be within the plane, in which case you won't get anything new. So that's the idea, so sort of we're fleshing out these vectors, not just the vectors themselves, but the multiples and additions. Another way of looking at it is this is the set of all A, C. So for any vector C with M coordinates, where here A is a matrix whose columns are V1 up to Vm. So if I form the matrix, who, with, with this as columns, and then I apply that matrix, I multiply the matrix by any vector, and I run over all possible vectors in Rm, then I get the span. And another way of writing this, which is actually the second concept, is the image of A. So that's actually my second concept, is that of the image. So th just to be more precise <laughs> on two, that is, the image of A is equal to the set of all vectors, A, you can say V if you prefer, or AX, 
where x is in Rm. Okay, so given any matrix, if you if the multi that matrix made f by every possible vector that's the correct dimension, namely m, then you flesh out what's called the image. You might think of it as the range, but in linear algebra we call it the image. So it might be the entire space Rn. I want to mention A here is n by m, so multiplication by A takes you from an m vector to an n vector. So the image lives inside Rn. Right? You take an m dimensional vector, you hit it with A, A times that vector, and you will get an n dimensional vector. And we are looking for all the possible vectors you can get, all the possible n-dimensional vectors you can get as you run over all the possible domain vectors within m dimensions. Okay? So we saw that. Yes, question. So the span of any vectors v1 to vm, what this is, this chain here, these are all different ways of looking at the same thing. The span of any collection of vectors whatsoever is precisely the image of the matrix whose columns are those vectors. It's not just any old matrix. You, you form the matrix A whose columns are the vectors. And then the image of that matrix A will be the same as the span of the vectors. And conversely, if you start with a matrix and say, well, what is its image? The answer is it's the span of the columns of that matrix. Another question. So does this Eliminate non -linear independent vectors? Nope. Okay, so the, I'm getting on to linear independence. I guess I, uh, I haven't talked about it yet, have I? No. Uh, it's coming. It's in 3.2. But the span could have redundant vectors, okay. right? So we, we're getting on to this, so I'll come back to that. I don't want to get on to that. I'm not quite there yet. But in any case, there's the definition of image. Uh, Again, and now the other, the other thing is we have this notion of, well, actually, before I finish the image, uh, if T is a linear transformation, so Rm to Rn is a linear transformation, it has a matrix A, that Tx, as we know, equals Ax, where A is the associated matrix of the transformation, and so by convention, m of t is the same thing as m of a. This, it's just the terminology, whether you'd say the image of a matrix or the image of a transformation. Technically, a transformation is not a matrix. It's a function. And yet, if it's a linear transformation, then t of x equals a times x for some matrix a. So tra linear transformations are identified with matrices. They're in correspondence, but they're not quite the same thing. So it's worth just noting that. But that's just a sort of philosophical thing. And then the third concept that I had from last time was the notion of kernel of a matrix or a transformation. It's the set of all x's which are in Rm such that a times x is 0. And this is the 0 vector in Rn, of course, because ax takes an m-dimensional vector and <laughs> an n-dimensional vector. Okay, so kernel of A is a subset of Rm. So it's very important to understand the kernel lives in the domain, m domain, you know, within the m vector space, and the image lives in the range or the codomain the n-dimensional space. And it can be a little bit confusing when m equals n, because they both obviously live in n space, but one is within the domain and one is with the range. Even though they're the same uh, space, you can still think of them as different objects. OK, a question. Why is it important to know what these are, as in kernel and image, or, or where they live? Oh, it's absolutely vital to know where they live. I mean, I'm going to be asking questions like, find a linear transformation whose kernel is, say, two four-dimensional vectors. OK, so you need to understand that your matrix has got to have m equals 4, but the n doesn't have to equal 4, for example. That's just one example. So it, it's, yeah, I mean, you need to know where these things go. And then later we'll be doing rank nullity theorem 
And that doesn't make any sense unless you know exactly which where they live. Anyway, again, uh, T kernel of uh, T a linear transformation is the same thing as kernel of A. That's just it's just a convention. I do have to say it. All right, so that's sort of a quick review of last time. Now, we noticed there were some important properties of both the image and the kernel. Namely, they were closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. What do I mean by closed? I mean, if you take two vectors in the image and you add them up, you get another vector in the image. And if you take two vectors in the kernel and you add them up, you get another vector in the kernel. We saw that last time. Um, what this means is that they are subspaces. So this is the topic of 3.2, subspaces. So what I want to deal with is some set W. So it's a subset of, say, Rn. We'll just take n instead of m, whatever. OK, so this is a subspace if. And you need to know the conditions, because sometimes questions are asked such as, is this set a subspace? And if you don't know the conditions, you have a lot of trouble solving it. So here are the three conditions. One, we need 0, the 0 vector to be in W. So a subspace has to include the origin, or the zero vector. OK? Two, if x and y are both in W, so is x plus y. Maybe I'll, I won't use elements. I'll just say is in. I'll write them out in words. OK? And three, if x is in w, so is kx for any scalar. Subspace. Now, if you want to be really sneaky, you can combine these together into the following. Instead of 2 and 3, you could say if x and y are in w and k and l are scalars, then kx plus ly is in W. So that somehow combines the scalar multiplication and the addition. In fact, from this condition, you can recover either. If you set K and L both equal 1, you get condition 2, X plus Y. And if you set L is 0, then you just see KX is in W, so you get condition 3. So for 2 and 3 together, you get this alternate version. So you might say, doesn't that include condition 1, that 0 is in W? And it almost does, indeed. If you have any, say, say you just had condition 3, and then said, oh, well, if x is in W, so is 0x, uh, which shows you that 0 is in W. So the only thing is that, what if there's no x at all in W? So basically, W could be the empty set. So that, that, can, that can screw you up. So that's not allowed. So you could actually replace it by this condition that W is not empty in the end and that and you, that, that could, you could do it. So the empty set is not a subspace. That's the only thing that this actually excludes. So yeah, I mean, basically, another way of thinking of this is this, by the way, is equal to, so the set of all these things, I'm sort of defacing the definition here, but all this is span of x and y is in W. So you can extend that to any number of vectors. So subspaces, if you take any number of vectors in the subspace and then take their span, all of that span is also in the subspace. That's another way of thinking about it. It's closed under linear combinations. You cannot bust out of the subspace by taking any uh, linear combination. So here's a question. Two dimensions. 
Unit disk. Is that a subspace? No. No. Why not? Because it violates both 2 and 3. Here's how it violates 3. There's a vector inside. Multiply it by 2. Outside. No good. What are the subspaces of R2? How about this? Is this a subspace? Okay, why is that not a subspace? It doesn't have 0 in it. Actually, it doesn't obey 2 or 3. All right. Uh, so the subspaces of R2 are R2 itself. Lines through the origin are good. Why doesn't it obey 3? Why doesn't it obey 3? Here is a vector. Twice the vector. Not the on the line. The is not on the subspace to begin with. Sure it is. I'm taking the vectors as being based at the, at the origin. And I'm saying that this vector here, that point is in the subspace. I'm thinking of... You have to say, if you're going to describe a set of vectors, then you have to say the vectors all start at zero it's by drawing a picture like this. Of, it's not even parallel to the subset. No, but it's still fine. I mean, I'm talking... I, when I draw this line, I mean these vectors. Ah. I don't mean this vectors here. Okay. okay? I, I, I mean all the vectors based at zero. Is in zero. zero. I should be precise about that, but yeah. Um, so any line through the origin, though, will be a subspace. Because if you add up two lines, two vectors which, on, which are on that line, you'll get another multiple of it. Same with scalar multiples, and zero is there. There's one more subspace of R2. What is it? Just the point zero. That's a subspace. Okay, how about in R3? What are the subspaces of R3? Well, there's R3 itself. There's every plane through the origin. There's every line through the origin. And then there's just the origin itself. OK, so these are very, very special subsets of the ambient space. OK, any questions about subspaces? Yeah. I didn't understand why the, instead of two, three combined the, the k, x plus l, y, why that doesn't satisfy the zero. Uh, oh, this is a very technical point, but I mean, OK, so the question, just going back to this, I, I don't want to get too bogged down. If you only have this, then sure, if you can find any two vectors in W, then, and even if they're the same vector, then you could set k and l to be 0 and see that 0 is in W. But if W is empty, then you can't, yeah, it's not a subspace. So you could replace 1, 2, and 3 by the condition that W is not empty and that, and that's good enough. It's just a very technical point. I don't want to get too bogged down about it. But uh, three, that condition almost has everything. Another question. Is there any like, general name for this like, class of things, like the lines over the origin and things like Linear spaces or vector spaces, yeah. But we've skipped chapter four, so. Or well, we will skip chapter four. So unfortunately, you, you won't see it in its full glory unless you read the chapter. OK, another question. Yeah, what are subspaces useful for? What are subspaces useful for? OK, well, the first thing I want to point out is that last time we saw that the image and the kernel are both subspaces. Okay, so that's one thing they're useful for. It's a common property between two different things. Okay, and another thing they're useful for is that they are linear spaces in their own right. So you can have linear transformations whose domain is a subspace. Because a subspace is like a copy of RK for some other so, for example, well, we're going to talk about dimension, but you can pretend that that is your entire domain. So you could sort of rotate it mentally so that it's just a copy of some other RK. Okay? So you can reapply all the theory that we've done to subspaces, but you cannot do linear transformations on something that's not a, sub on a linear space itself. Okay? So it allows you to work with not all of RM and yet still still have linear maps, linear transformations. Okay, so that's the main point. Now, so as I said last time, we have seen that Kerr A is a subspace of Rm and image of A is a subspace of Rn. Again, this is assuming A is n by m. Okay, so before on this other board I wrote that they were subsets. This equation, or 
inequality set inequality says the image is a subset of Rn, but it's not any old subset. It is actually a subspace of Rn, and similarly, Kerr A is a subspace of Rm. We don't have a good notation here for subspace. You just have to write out the words is a subspace of. I've seen you know less than. And I don't know how standard any notation is. So. Uh, all right. So moving on. I am going to show you later today how to construct matrices or linear transformations with specified kernels or images. And in fact, I'm going to show you pretty soon how to find the image or the kernel of a given linear transformation. So these are two questions we're going to look at. Okay, I'm not going to say more about them yet because I'm going to come back to them. Um, so the really the other concept that I absolutely have to discuss about subspaces is the notion of linear independence and basis. Okay, so the rest of the concept of this chapter okay so suppose I have a bunch of vectors And I want to consider their span. Okay, so that first of all, in the language of what we've said, if I take the span of V1 up to Vm, this is a subspace of Rn. Okay, let's say these are n dimensional vectors. But we have m of them. So their span is a subspace. Okay, I didn't prove that, but by definition of the span, I mean it's very, it's, it's come straight from here. Any two vectors in the span, their linear combinations are also linear combinations of the original vectors, v1 through vm. Okay, so the span and is a subspace. But actually, I did, I did kind of prove it because, of course, the span of those vectors over here is the image of a particular matrix whose columns are those vectors and the image is a subspace. So actually I, I did prove it. So anyway, going back to there, what if I could say take the span of all the vectors except for the last one? Well, that may or may not be the same thing. It's certainly not more. This is a subset of the previous span. But it might be equal to if the span with this crossed out is the same as the original span, as in you don't get any more vectors by throwing in the last one. Let, let me put in. Well, what does that mean? It means that by putting in Vm, I did not get anything new. I didn't get any new vectors. So that must mean that Vm itself can be written as a linear combination of the others. If it can, then of course any linear combination involving Vm, you could just break Vm itself down into the others and you get nothing new. So if that's true, then it must be true that Vm is some linear combination of the first m minus 1. And conversely, conversely, in the sense that if this is true, then this is true. If that's true, then putting Vm in doesn't give you anything new. Okay? In fact, it's worth just seeing why that is. Suppose that this is true. Just assume this. All m of them. I want to show that you don't need the last one. This is the converse of what I'm trying to say, of what I said before. 
So I want to show that x is actually, you don't need the last one. So by definition, x is equal to c1. Oh, let's use a different letter. Let's use um, capital C. c1, v1, plus c2, v2, plus c, m minus 1, v, m minus 1, plus c, m, v, m. And I want to show that actually you don't need this last one. Well, but by this equation, I'm going to use capitals. I can replace the last one by this little linear combination of little c's up to up to cm minus one. And then all I have to do is group terms and expand. So how many V1s do I have? Well, well I have capital C1 plus capital CM, little c1, lots of V1, and so on. And then I will have capital C, M minus 1, plus capital CM, little CM minus 1. Sorry, there's no vector there. The M minus 1. Sorry, I shouldn't have used capital C's and little c's, but hopefully it's clear enough. So the point is, this is itself a linear combination of just the first m minus 1s. So this is in span. You're not going to have to be able to prove this, but you do have to be aware of the concept. OK, so what I've proved here by description is that if the mth vector is redundant, then it's a linear combination of the others. And then conversely, if the mth vector is a linear combination of the others, then the span doesn't need the last one. So what I want to say is that vm here is a redundant vector. You didn't need it for the span. You did not need it. It's redundant. So actually, you could play a certain game, as it were. It's not a very fun game, but a mathematical sort of game that can be quite useful is you start with the last one and see if you see if it's redundant. If it is, then you throw it away. You don't need it. If it, if it isn't, then you keep it. Then you go to the previous one and see if you see that, that is redundant from all of the rest of them. If it is, then you throw it out. If not, you keep it. And you keep on going until you just have the ones that you need. And that's going to be special. And I'll tell you about that once I answer this question. Do all vectors start at the origin? I mean, in principle, vectors don't start anywhere. They can be moved around. But if you're going to draw a set and say, that's how I'm thinking of my set, then you, might, you have to anchor them somewhere. And you normally anchor them at the origin. OK? Right, so what I've gotten to is the notion of linear independence. OK, so linear, so I'm going to say that v1 up to vm this set is linearly independent, and I'll just write it as indept, but you can write out independent if you want. I'm going to say this is true if, it, if there are no redundant vectors. So you're not allowed to throw any one of them out. If you threw any one of those vectors out, you would get a smaller span. So another way of saying this is, OK, i.e., well, I'll write just what I said. If you remove any of them, any one of the m vectors, the new span is smaller. And we saw that the only way that can't happen is if one of them is a linear combination of the others, i.e., no vector, OK, none of v1 up to vm is a linear combination of the other. of the other m minus 1.
These are all different ways of saying the same thing. I.e., and here's the best way of saying it. If C1V1 plus C2V2 and so on plus CMVM is the zero vector, all CI are zero. That is a very nice way of saying what linear independence means. Now, in order to explain it, let's just come back over here for a second. If Vm is redundant, then I can write Vm as a linear combination of the others. So what I could do is just bring this over, write 0 equals this, minus Vm. And think of this as plus minus 1. So there's a, there's a coefficient of minus 1 here. This says that a linear combination of all the Vms is 0, where these are not all 0, because that one is minus 1. OK, so this is a much more symmetric way of saying it. It doesn't rely on which vector is redundant. So I come over here, and I say, sure, if all these systems, c1, c2, are 0, then yes, this vector will equal 0. But if there's some choice that are not, then I could pick one of them that's not 0, put it over the other side and divide by it, and express a vector in terms of the others. It's a linear combination of the others. So this is the best way of of saying what linear independent means. Okay? There's one other way I want to characterize it. Suppose I take matrix A whose columns are V1 through Vm. Then A C equals 0 has the unique solution C equals 0. Wouldn't A be the 0? No, well, I mean, I want, OK. You want to know when certain vectors are linearly independent. So you form a matrix whose columns are those vectors. Now, you don't have any choice about that. The, I'm, I'm giving you m vectors. I form a matrix, n, n by m matrix, whose columns are these vectors. And I say, when can you solve a c equals 0? I say the only possibility is when c equals 0. In fact, that is exactly the same as this. By the definition of matrix multiplication, a c <laughs> is exactly c1 v1 plus c2 v2, and so on. That's, that's the definition of matrix vector multiplication. So if it has a unique solution, then that's exactly saying all c's are 0 is the same as c equals 0 as a vector. In other words, kernel of this matrix is just 0. The only vector that A sends to 0 when you multiply it is the zero vector. Every other vector gives you something that's non-zero. These are all the same thing. They're just different ways of expressing the same concept. So this is another very useful way. OK, question. Yes, that's the, the only solution to this equation is when they're all equal to zero, i.e., the vector of c's, ci's, has is the zero vector. No, sorry. If we thought this the CFM was minus one, therefore C is not zero, and when you combine them, it was still zero. Right. So basically, in this equation here, the one in this equation right here, though, for the moment, says that these vectors are not linearly independent. Yes, these are not linearly independent because they contain a redundant vector. So here I was defining what a redundant vector is. Then I was saying that if there's a redundant vector, then you can have an equation where they're not all zero, 
that gives you zero. And now I say that linearly independent means no redundant vectors, which means that you cannot have an equation where the linear combination is zero. You had a question as well. And that's called non-trivial. Is it called what, sorry? That all CIs are zero. Is that called non-trivial? Yeah, and a way of saying this is this obviously has a solution that C1 equals C2 equals up to so on equals CM equals zero. That's an obvious or trivial solution. So if this equation is satisfied for some, with at least one non-zero one of, of the Cs, you call that a non-trivial solution. Yeah, that's just a <laughs> trivial in this case, meaning obvious, as in all zeros is clearly going to work. So in that case, it's trivial. Uh, yeah, another way is, i.e., this has only a trivial solution. And you would say C1 equals C2 equals, equals Cm equals 0. OK. Any other questions about linear independence? I'm not doing examples just yet, because I haven't told you how to find kernels. But once I pack it up together and say, are these vectors linearly independent, the best way to do it is this. So we'll come back to that. OK, so we're going to put all these concepts together. This is still quite a theoretical but We're going to attack problems soon with the vengeance. All right. So I want you to look at this collection of vectors. OK? So this is a subspace. I'm going to pick some vectors. So pick, a, pick this with all the vi's in w. So I'm going to pick m vectors from the subspace. OK, so we have two notions. We have span, and we have linear independence. So I want to consider the span of these vectors. OK, all these vectors live in w. So w is not all of Rn. OK? W is part of Rn. So think of it like this. Here's three dimensions. W is some plane through the origin, say. Some plane through the origin. And let's say I pick two vectors in the plane and take their span. Well, that will be part of W. In fact, it will be all of W. What if I only took one vector? It would just be some line in W. So it may or may not be all of W. Could you possibly get outside of W by taking the span of vectors in, ve in W? No, because W is a subspace. You cannot get outside a subspace by taking linear combinations of vectors in it. So the span of vectors in it is a subspace of W. It may or may not be all of W, but it's certainly within W. Okay. Okay. My question is, how do you ensure that you get all of W? You've got to have enough vectors. How do you ensure that you don't have too many vectors? Well, you don't want any of them to be redundant. OK, so if I want to just be very minimalist and describe W, and I only take one vector here, I only get this line. That's not good enough. If I take two vectors, I could get all of W unless I was really stupid and took the two vectors going along the same line, in which case I'd still only get the line. So, but if I took two vectors, I could be golden. What if I took three vectors, all in the plane? Well, I'd still only get the plane, so one of them must be redundant. OK, so somehow I don't want, to, well, I, I need enough vectors So that, or I want, let's say I want enough vectors so that the span of W, the span of the vectors rather, 
is all of W. But I want few vectors so that none of them are redundant, i.e. they're all linear, well, these vectors are linearly independent. So span means I have enough. Linearly independent means I don't have too many. It's, you know, it's the three bears, right? Too hot, too cold, just right. This is the just right. If you can do this, if you can do this, then we'll say V1 up to Vm is a basis for W. In other words, i.e. V1 up to Vm, well maybe you don't even need the selection there, is a basis for W only if, if and only if, well that means two things. You have the, you have enough of them to so that the span is all of W. Well, maybe I've left out a zero step. I'm going to write that again down here. It means first of all zero. <laughs> v1 and Vm are all in W. That's sort of obvious. One the span of them, this is what I just erased, is W, and 2, V1 up to Vm, that collection is linearly independent, or are linearly independent, lin indent. Okay, and I just want to emphasize, this means that you have enough, have enough vectors. And this means you don't have too many. Just right. Okay, so that's the definition of a basis. So as we've seen, for a plane in R3, you need two vectors. But they can't just be any two vectors, because if the vectors were along the same line, you wouldn't get the plane, you'd just get the line. So actually you need two linearly independent vectors, and that will do. All right. So it goes without saying that you need to know the definition of span and linear independence. So in particular, if you have a basis, then they are linearly independent, which means that if you try to solve and write down an equation like this for your basis vectors, the only solution is with all the c's are zero. That's just the same as saying they're linearly independent, but that's half of the definition. So you can't know what the definition of a basis is unless you also know what linear independence means and what this plan is. So those are the two key parts of the definition. A question. Notation. Yeah, W is a subspace of Rn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it does. It's not the same thing that this is in W and this is in Rn. W is not all of Rn. It's only part of Rn. So Vi are vectors that lie in W, which is a plane or some sort of spacey type of thing within Rn, but not all of it. So in my example up here, the basis vectors have to lie in that plane. Like This is not a basis vector for W. It, it cannot be part of any basis for W because it's not even in W. So my condition 0 says that the basis vectors, for heaven's sake, have to be in W. And their span has to be all of W, but not all of Rn. Vi are vectors in W, whereas W is a set. Okay? Just a second. 
W is a subset of Rn. That's what, it's, it's part, it's a collection of very many vectors. Rn is all the n-dimensional vectors. W is many, many vectors that happen to flesh out a plane or some, some linear type of object. W could be all of Rn, right. Okay, your question. Oh, there's definitely some sort of relationship between M and N. Um, M has to be less than N or equal to N. But it, this now leads into the next section, which is the dimension of a subspace. So I move on to 3.3. And this is going to have very many more question, uh, sort of examples. So I kind of feel like... Although there were problems based on 3.2, it makes sense to do all the 3.2 and 3.3 theory together, hit you with it, and then Okay, so it's very important to understand about bases, not just for some abstract technical reason, but because of a very useful fact. So here's a fact. Any two bases of a subspace W have the same number of vectors. So in my example, where W was a plane in R3, I said, OK, I could take this vector and this vector. So those two vectors together are linearly independent and flesh out, span the whole plane. Okay. So what I'm trying to say, though, this fact says that if you want to find any basis, it has to have, for this, for this W here, it has to have two vectors. No more, no, no fewer. Two vectors for that particular subspace. So it could be this and this, but if you only have one, you won't get all of W. And if you have three or more, then they're not linearly independent. Okay, so it's a magic number for that particular subspace. So this number is called the dimension of W. So planes, by definition, are two-dimensional subspaces. Planes through the origin. Lines are one-dimensional subspaces. There's only one zero-dimensional subspace, which is just that subspace, which is just the vector zero. Three-dimensional subspaces are spaces. <laughs> They're spacey spaces. I don't know. It's sort of hard to describe because it's hard to think of four dimensions. But if, if this was four dimensions and this was a big swathe of three-dimensional space in there, then that would be a subspace. The only way I can possibly think of it is to have space and time as one axis. And so you look at, look at space, you look at space, and every second or every millisecond or every instant of time, you look at space. And so the only subspace that I can easily describe in that four-dimensional space that is three-dimensional is at the instant of time when t equals zero. So t equals zero, bang, all the space, and then it goes away. That's a three-dimensional subspace of four dimensions, where the fourth dimension is time. But it has to be time zero, because it has to pass through the origin. Anyway, enough of relativity for the moment. Uh, now, but by the way, relativity does deal with four-dimensional space, or space-time, and does consider subspaces. OK, anyway, never mind. Uh, that's too advanced. OK, there's the fact. The definition of dimension, then, you have to know. You have to understand. And so, if I of with two vectors in it, and there's no other possible number of basis vectors. All right. So, another way of looking at this then is suppose you are working. Say that the dimension of W, which I'm going to put like this, is M, and W 
is in Rn subspace. It has to be a subspace to have a dimension. Non-subspaces, non-linear subspaces, the, the dimension doesn't mean anything in this context. So say the dimension of W is M. So this means, this means you can find V1, Vm, which are a basis, i.e. the span of V1, I'm just writing this out again to drum it in, is all of W, and V1 up to Vm linearly independent. So not anything new here. So here is something slightly new. Suppose I have any collection of, of vectors. So again, the dimension of W is M. And we have any vectors. Say V1, I won't even put a set, V1 up to VK, which live, they all live in this subspace. Question. Um, so, sorry. But so you can find V one V M vectors that are in the subspace of W, or full vectors in the subspace of W. Okay, so W itself is a subspace of R N. Okay, it, I'm saying it, I'm assuming it has dimension M. So I can find M vectors in, in it that are, they, they are in W, yeah, in W, which are a basis. I mean, the basis has to be in W. Okay, so now I just want to, though, say I have this M dimensional subspace and I have any K vectors in W. Okay, so first of all, if K is less than M, then what can you say? So if you don't have m vectors, forget basis, these are just any old k vectors that you pick, but we, k is smaller than m, so m might be 3 and I'm only picking 2 vectors. What can you say about the span of v1 up to vk? It's not, it, well it's certainly within w, but it's not all of w, so i.e span is not all of W. This notation here I was writing as a subset but not equal to. That's like a less than but not equal to. So it's a subset of W, in fact a subspace of W, but you don't have enough vectors. If it was all of W, if it were all of W, that's better, then it could be a basis. In fact, it could even have redundant vectors, in which case you could slash some of them away and get a, va a basis. But k would have to be at least as big as m. On the other hand, what if k is bigger than m? So I'm now taking any k vectors in w where k is more than m. So if w is a plane, I'm taking, say, three, four vectors. What can you say about these vectors? Oh, you can say something. What do you think? One of them must be redundant, i.e., the collection is not nearly independent. Then you have too many vectors for the dimension of the subspace that you're working on. Yes, at least m of them are independent, but maybe they're all, maybe k is 3, m is, they can all be the same vector. Or, multi, or scalar multiple. Okay, so you're trying to challenge what I was saying. But if they're, okay, so what you're saying is, say m is 2 and k is 3. Couldn't these be all the same vector? But if they are all the same vector, they're certainly not linearly independent, because 1 minus the second one would be 0. Right. Okay, So i.e., I stand by my statement. If you have more than k vectors in an m-dimensional space, then they must be linearly dependent, as in not linearly independent. One at least, at least one redundant. Okay, so the dimension doesn't just affect bases, it affects any collection of vectors to the tune of, if you don't have enough of them, 
you can't possibly span the whole thing. And if you have too many of them, they can't be linearly independent. A question. Uh, two was in this particular example. Oh, oh, you mean the two here? Yeah. The question is, okay, I said fact, any two bases have the same, and the question is, w w what about three? Well, if I give you three bases, say, I'll call them B1, B2, and B3. So B1 has the same number of elements as B2, and B2 has the same number of elements as B3. Therefore, B1 has the same number of elements as B3. So any three bases, it's basically all the bases have the same number of elements, yes. If you give me any two bases, they have the same number of elements. That means all the bases, all of them have exactly the same number of elements, yeah. So two is arbitrary, and yet it's enough to say that all of them have the same number. Another question. Can you write all the bases in terms of uh, the other bases? Can you write all the bases in terms of the other bases? That is the subject of 3.4, but the answer is yes. And in fact, that's coordinates. That's exactly what we're going to and we'll talk about that later. So, so I don't mind being uh, you asking ahead because it, it, sh it shows that you're asking the logical questions here. But I will defer the answer for a little bit. All right. So that's the theory I want to talk about for a little bit. I want to ask a very sort of fundamental question. So practical problems. Practical. See, I don't even like practical problems. I can't write the word practical. All right. So here goes. Given a matrix or a transformation, find the kernel of A and the image of A. Okay, so these are both subspaces. So what we're being asked to do is find subspaces. And by our understanding, what this really means is find bases for. Okay, so now in our understanding, we can best describe a subspace by a basis. I, I don't even really care which basis. If you have one basis, that's pretty good. You want exactly the right number of vectors in it, though. The dimension. Now, when I say bases for, that's a shorthand for saying, i.e., it's two parts. I.e., one, a basis for curve A, and two, a basis for M A. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, here's an example. Okay, I'll give you a matrix. One, two, three, two, one. Three, six, nine, six, three. One, two, four, one, two. Two, four, nine, one, two. Okay, so there's a matrix A. It happens to be four by five. Question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, if you notice, like one column is a uh, multiple of another. Yeah, yeah, if you notice the one column's one multiple of the other, then you start to see that yes, already there's some yeah, relation. Can you do but anything before you do the reduced echelon form, like get rid of one. Or you might be able to to, to shave some corners. Yeah, there there are time-saving methods, but I'd rather teach well, something yeah, that's yeah. more general here. So I want to find the kernel and the image of that. Okay, so the first step is to find the reduced row echelon form. It's a very useful thing. Okay, so we've done this thing. You know, you've got to subtract three things of that and one of that and two of that, and actually you'll get zeros here because this row is a multiple of this. So you're going to have to switch the rows and all that sort of stuff. So take it from me, or do it yourself if you don't believe it, that the reduced row echelon form looks like this. Like one, two, two, zero, five, zero. Zero, zero, one, minus one, zero. Zero, 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 one. 
and the last row is all zero. Okay, so you could do that yourself. And you should, you should, wouldn't hurt. Okay, so I want to use this information to find the kernel and the image. Now it turns out the image is actually much easier than the kernel. To find the image, all you have to do is locate the non-redundant columns. One, two, and three. So you find the leading ones. So to find the image, just take columns of A corresponding to the leading one columns of the reduced version of A. So in our example, those leading ones occur in the first, the third, and the fifth columns. So that means that the image is simply the span of, the, of this vector, this vector, and this vector. It's like magic. The span of 1, 3, 1, 2, 3, 9, 4, 9, 1, 3, 2, 2. Whoa. How do I know? Why does that work? Well, first of all, what's one? But just looking at the matrix, what is one obvious way of writing the image of A? Well, I want to write it as the span of something, though. The span of all five columns, right? The span of all five columns is, by definition, the image of A. What I am saying is you can omit the second and the third column. How do I know? Well, it all comes down to this. When you reduce it, you're doing linear operations. So the fact that this is a 2 and this is a 1, right then, means automatically that the second column here is twice the first. <laughs> and so it is quite nice. It's quite nice. This one's a little bit more complicated though because it has a 5 and a minus 1. But what it basically says is the fourth column is 5 times the first column minus 1 times the third column. And if you take 5 times this column minus this, I guarantee you get that. Let's see. 5 1's minus 3 is 2. 5 threes is 15, minus 9 is 6. 5 ones minus 4 is 1. 5 twos is 10, minus 9 is 1. So this right there, I can see the 5 and the minus 1 and say, hey, that column is actually a linear combination of the first and the third. You don't even need the fifth. And it's 5 times this, minus 1 times that. Whereas this one could not be written as a linear combination of the others because that one doesn't relate to anything else. If it could, then you'd get a zero there. I saw a question. Yeah. Uh, why do we find, like, why do, do the bases are the best to describe a subspace? Like, I, that seems what you're saying, right? That, like, when you're asked to find the kernel of the image, it's best, since they have subspaces, you just find the bases of them is what the real question Well, you find, okay, so the question is, why is a basis the best way? And I just want to correct something you said when okay. you say the basis. There's no unique basis, right? Okay. right? So the question is, why wouldn't it be enough to say, uh, well, it's just the span of this, okay? It is enough, in a way, but it is not the cleanest thing you can say. If you say the span of these three vectors, right. then you immediately can describe very easily what any vector in the subspace is. Not only is it a linear combination, but it turns out it's only a linear combination in one way. Any vector that is in this span is exactly something times this plus something times this plus something times this in one and only one way. But that again preempts 3.4, the notion of coordinates, right? So it's much more valuable to write that than the span of five vectors where you actually don't need two of them. Okay, we had another question. I'll come back to the other questions, but go ahead. It's a bit of a side issue, but I remember when Homer from class last week, I think, there's a question about 
is the image of A is equal to the image of the traditional echelon form of A, and it's nil. Okay, so the, the question is, is the image of A equal to the image of the reduced row echelon form? And the, the answer is no. Um, and the best way to do it is by a counterexample. Okay, there's no reason why the image should be... So basically, there's no reason why the kernel should be a priori either. But you can prove that one is and you can't prove that the other... And you can find a counterexample for the other one. So... Um, I don't have an obvious reason other than saying, well, just look at it. I mean, the, the image of this matrix does not include no vector in the image of this matrix has a fourth component, right? Whereas these clearly do. So what went wrong? Well, we switched rows around to get this. In fact, the very first one gives you 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So we switched rows around. <laughs> If you're going to switch rows around and expect these things to be compatible, then you've got to switch the coordinates there. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. But you're not allowed to switch columns. So that gives you some hope that the kernel will be okay. If you could switch columns, then you'd have to s switch the kernel part. See, the kernel, you multiply this matrix by something. The image, you don't. The image are all four-dimensional, whereas the kernel, as we'll see, are five-dimensional vectors. And so... The, the, I, th I think there's an obvious reason why the image can't, but the kernel's more sophisticated, and we'll get into that in a second. Another question. I was wondering if this is an efficient way to determine whether vectors are linear or independent. You can put them in a matrix. And the question is, is this an efficient way to find whether vectors are linearly independent? And the answer is essentially yes, because one of the definitions I gave for linearly independent is that the kernel is nothing. And so to find the kernel... You need to do it, I mean, you don't need to, but the one good way of doing it is finding the reduced form. And so now I'm going to find the kernel and we'll see whether these things are linearly independent or not. But then this nice rank nullity theorem will put it all together and you'll see exactly how it all works. Um, yes, another question. I mean just the zero vector. Yeah, yeah the, the kernel can never be empty. Zero is always in the kernel. Zero is always in the image. Kernel and image are subspaces. Okay. So, I've showed you how to find the image. And as you see, the solution was extremely straightforward, although the explanation was not so straightforward. <laughs> to see why you could drop two of them was sort of significant or difficult. Now, how about to find the kernel? Well, to find kernel of A... You just have to solve AX equals 0 by definition. That's the same thing. Find all the solutions of AX equals 0, which means effectively that you're solving A of 0, that matrix. Now, the beautiful thing about having a 0 there is when you do the row reductions, you always get 0. You then you can change that into something non-zero. So that will be the same as... the reduced row form. So when we found this, I mean, I'm just saying, put a zero here and put a zero here. Zero, 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 zero. You don't even need to write it in, but you can if you want. So one way of doing it then is as follows. The first equation says, so I'm gonna work from here. The first equation says x1 plus two x2 plus 5x4 equals 0. In other words, we know x2 and x4 are the redundant vectors, so write x1 in terms of them. Well, not redundant vectors, redundant coordinates. x2 is just x2. x3 is going to write I have this equation, x3 minus x4 equals 0. So we'll come across from there to here. And we see that x3 equals x4. Also, x4 equals x4. And finally, x5 equals 0. That comes from this, x5 equals 0. 
So that means, wrapping it all up, that the complete vector x, which is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, is equal to x2 lots of the vector minus 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. Plus x4 lots of the vector minus 5, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, that's just from chapter 1, solving ax equals 0 in the case where there are redundant coordinates. We have often relabeled these, these as rx, rx or something like that. Like. But basically, this is a linear combination of these two vectors. Bang, bang. So these vectors are a basis for the kernel. So cur A is the span of these two basis vectors. Minus 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. And minus 5, 0, 1, 1, 0. Question. Uh, you should write them as two vectors because the kernel is the span of two vectors. If you wrote it as the span of a matrix, then you could get fancy and say it's the image of that matrix. But that's just getting silly. They, I want to see the basis vectors in the span. Yeah? Um, the self question, question, do we have to write the span or can you just write the two vectors? You could say kernel A has as a basis these two vectors, uh, right? But yeah, you should write something like that. Okay, so. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I solved A0. Okay, so the whole, if you believe the whole method of reduced row echelon form then it says the solution to A0 is the same as the solution to RREFA0. Because every step that you do is a linear transformation of the rows and the columns, so it preserves the solution space as well. And then every step that you do keeps the zeros, because all linear combinations of zero are zero. So now this answers your question. Yes, you. Sorry, I don't know your name. This answers your question, which is this. Why is the kernel of A the same as the kernel of the reduced row echelon form? And it is exactly because of this. If you adjoin 0 to the right of A and you do the same steps, this, then you double end 0 with on the right. right. That's actually the proof. Okay? I mean, you have, to under, you have to believe the general idea that if you have a B there and whatever the B becomes, then they have the same solution. But in the special case of 0, you get the kernel. All right? Another question. Does it matter if the signs are reversed? So, for example, you had 2 and minus 1 there? Yeah. What do you think? Yes. The question is, is the answer still correct if I did this? Is that, is that a correct answer? Yes. Yes. Yes, of course. Anything in the span of the original 2, you just reverse the coefficients and you will get the correct answer as well. In fact, you could replace this by 4 minus 2. Any multiple of either of the vectors is, has the same span. So that would be an acceptable answer. There are also other acceptable answers where you can just find any basis of this. So there are other bases. But this is the most logical one. Now, the now, clever trick for finding this. I'm certainly not going to get up to chapter 5, but that's okay. Or, and it, it actually touches on what I said. Let me rewrite the reduced form. I don't know what this hubbub is outside, but... Pretty damn loud. <laughs> Do I need to shut the door? Maybe not. OK. So we'll go back to this. And I will go and show you another sort of way of finding the kernel. Here's another way of finding the kernel. OK. See this 1? 
This two here means if you. Okay. Hey. Could you guys keep it down, please? Thank you. What I'm trying to say is because this is twice this column, this means that the original vector, as I said, in the original A, that column is twice that column. So another way of looking at this is suppose I call these bases vectors, or these vectors B1, B2, B3, B4, and B5. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is you can see immediately that B2 is twice B1. Okay? So what does this mean? This means that minus 2B1 plus B2 equals 0, which immediately tells me I'm calling this column B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. So this immediately tells me that a vector minus 2, 1, 0, 0, 0 is in the kernel. And then that is probably why you asked me that question, I think. Well, what did I get? Did I put, oh, no, no. OK, my method comes out the same. OK, doesn't matter. You could have asked me the question for any reason, because you were right, as it turns out. So yes, but the method here will come up with the same thing, unless, of course, you write 2b1 minus b2 is 0, in which case you get the opposite. Anyway. So that's working with this. Now, let's work with this vector here. This is five lots of this column minus one lot of this column. So this tells me that B4 is five lots of B1 minus one lot of B3. How am I doing this? I'm just picking. I started with B2 because it was the first non-redundant vector. I'm going to use these two, I'm not, not no, I'm redundant, redundant. I'm going to use these two redundant vectors to find the two vectors in the kernel, or at least two, the two vectors in the basis of the kernel that I'm looking for. So B2, I go up, I say 2, and I can see that I can build it from the 1. Whereas B4, I, I see this 5 and minus 1, so that 5 I need to use this one, and this minus 1 I need to use this one. So that's how I'm getting this. And this means that 5b1, uh, minus 5b1, I'll put everything on the left, plus b3, plus b4, equals 0. In other words, the coefficients of this form the basis vector. Minus 5, 0, 1, 1, 0. So that's another way of coming up with the two vectors. It's a little bit sneakier. But it saves you the trouble of gathering these coordinates like I did over here. It's more direct. A question? Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you write that. You'll just get the negative, and that goes back to your question there. Okay. The method there is for each column which is redundant in the sense that there's no leading one, just find out which vector in the same place so write down these vectors here, and you see, okay, the 2 is twice the 1. The 5 is 5 times the 1, so that's b4 is 5b1, but then minus this 1 in the same row, which corresponds to b3. It's, it's quite sneaky, but it gives you the kernel in a different way. So you can choose which method you want. A question. I just always see that it works. Well, you have to agree that this column is twice this one, right? Yeah. right? So that means if you, if you now consider the matrix as b1, b2, b3, b4, b5, and you multiply by the vector minus 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, that will give you the vector which is minus 2, b1, plus b2, which is 0. Okay, and because it, so you're working with this reduced thing, and you say, oh, well, look, if I hit this reduced with minus 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, I get twice that column, or twi minus 2 times that column plus that column, which is 0. Okay. And if that's true for the reduced one, it must also be true for the granddaddy one, or grandmother one, or ancestor, the original A. OK?
Jolly good. So I've shown you how to do the image and kernel in two different ways of the kernel of a linear transformation. And obviously you have to practice it. I've seen on almost every midterm. Here is a matrix, find its kernel, find its image. Okay, you need to know how to do it. Now, one, back to a piece of theory, and then back to the opposite question of this, which is going to be find a matrix with a given kernel or a given image. But first, I want to show you this really important theorem, which is called the rank nullity theorem, but as the book mentions, some people think of it as the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. So here it goes. In order to motivate it, take a look at this. Okay. A takes five dimensional vectors and turns them into four dimensional vectors when you multiply. Okay? Some five dimensional vectors, though, it turns into zero. Which ones? Anything in this span. So a plane within R5, if you like, a two dimensional subspace of R5. Yes, so A, in this case, A takes R5 to R4. It's really multiplication by A, so A times blank. You start, you fill in the blank, and you have to fill it in with an R5 vector, and you get back an R4 vector. Now, there's a specific plane inside R5. It's hard to draw R5, so I'm just going to draw it like as R3, but there's a specific plane, the span of two vectors that A sends into nothing. Okay, now that's the kernel being two-dimensional. What was the dimension of the image? Well, we found the image, in principle, you need five vectors, but actually you can throw two of them away. You only need three of them. So the image was three dimensions. So in R4, which is sort of hard to draw as well, I have only three dimensions. It's really hard to draw that, but I don't get all of R4. I'm missing one dimension. R4 has four dimensions, of course, and I'm, I'm missing one. Yes? Whenever, whenever they say give us an image, is it implied that you can assume some of that requirement? If they say give you a basis for the image, then by definition it has to be as few as possible. But image can be a basis for it. Yeah, I mean, if it said describe the image, you could technically get away with saying span of that. Just like if they say simplify you know, ddx of so-and-so, or you could argue, oh, it's simplified enough, or, you know, but you should just generally give the span. A question. Yes, yes, thank you. Oh, um, how do you know for the kernel it's a plane, as opposed to a line? How do I know it's a plane? Because in this example, I found this kernel had too many dimensional Okay, so in this example, it's two. Now, here's what I want you to understand. R5... The kernel in this particular case, two dimensions. So that's two get put down to zero. So what about the other three directions? <laughs> I can't draw three directions, but you've got to imagine that I could find five directions which are all sort of different dimensions. They're all perpendicular to each other, say. Okay, two of them go away. What about the other three? Well, somehow the other three don't go away and Whatever the other three go to, they get preserved, copied, maybe distorted, but they get copied into the image, the three-dimensional subspace of R4. So what I'm trying to say is that I'm sort of mentally breaking up R5 into two pieces. One piece is the kernel, which has dimension two, and the other piece is a three-dimensional piece that somehow becomes the image. I don't need the two-dimensional subspace of the kernel for the image. It doesn't, doesn't do it. It, just, it gets compressed down to zero. But the other three become the image. And they don't just get co collapsed onto the image. They, are, they become the image. So that sounds a little bit weird. But what I'm trying to say is, looking at this matrix, once I hear that the kernel is two-dimensional, I immediately know that the image is three-dimensional. It's sort of the rest of it. Okay, how do I know? Because 2 plus 3 equals 5. Okay, that's the rank nullity theorem in a nutshell. Okay, basically it comes down to this. There are three leading ones. Each of them 
gives me a vector in the image, none of which I can dispense with. Whereas there are two columns without leading ones, each of which leads to a vector in the kernel. And the methodology that I've shown you for finding the image and the kernel makes it very plain. Right? In the case of the image, obviously, if my method works, and I think I've justified it, at least not proved it, but justified it a little bit, then the dimension of the image is the same as the number of ones, of leading ones, i.e. the rank. So the first comment that I have is this. The dimension of the image of A is the same as the rank of A. Ha! That's a nice fact. So the IE equals the number of leading ones in the reduced form. That's how we define the rank. Actually, normally the rank is defined as the dimension of the image. And then you prove that it's the same as the number of ones. But we didn't know what an image was until not long ago. So that's why we had to define rank. So this is actually the definition of rank A. It's the dimension of the image. OK, so what I'm trying to say is I look at this matrix and I see three ones. I know the uh, three leading ones. lead to two kernel vectors which are independent, i.e. I see the other two and those two lead to kernel vectors. So I immediately know that the dimension of the kernel is two. Question. How does that lead to, like is R4 connected to any of this? Element? No, R4 doesn't really have much to do with it. Okay, so. Right? As long as it's at least, I mean, it could be R3. You got that big, you just got rid of the bottom row. It could be R3, indeed. If you got rid of the bottom row, it would be okay. Actually, no, no, you have to get rid of this row, I think. Oh. Yeah, you've got to be a little careful because I switched the row. But what it could not be is R2 because the image is not big enough. Right. The image has to be three-dimensional, and it's a subspace of something, right. so it has to be at least three. A question. So the dimension of a characteristic that's starting at R5, the dimension that leads can be at most five? The dimension of the image can be at most five. Because you could not, yep, because the rank has to, I mean, the rank is the dimension of the image. Right, but it could now, be less than that. it could be, and in fact, if it's a four by five matrix like this, then the image can be no more than four dimensional. Right. In fact, the image is a subspace of R4, so it's obviously not more than right. four dimensional. But one of the facts that we saw is that a rank of a matrix can be not more than the number of rows or the number of columns, because you just can't squeeze enough ones in otherwise. Okay, so anyway, the first thing I wanted to say then is the dimension of the image is the same as the rank. The dimension of the kernel of A is called the nullity. That's just, you know, kernel is where which vectors A sends to zero. So the nullity is sort of how much A sends to zero. And as it turns out, this is equal to the number of non-leading or redundant columns so every column has either got a leading one in which case it contributes one to this or it does not have a leading one in which case it's redundant in which case it contributes one to this so guess what the sum of this is Yep, rank of A plus the nullity of A equals the number of columns of A. Because every column is either got a leading one or is redundant. Yeah. That is the rank nullity theorem. I didn't really prove it, but I guess it'd be more or less like the gist of it. So it's pretty important. All right. So 
There are a whole lot of true-false questions that can be spawned from this. And I don't propose to go over them now because I'm sure we'll be spending plenty of time next time and I really want to look at 3.4 before we finish. So let me just give you one true-false question leading on to something else. And here it goes. What I want to do is answer this question. Find a linear transformation or a matrix A, which I'm going to say n by m. Actually, I'm going to even say what it is. I'll fill this in with kernel exactly equal to the span of two vectors, which I will give to you as 1, 0, 1, 5, and 1, 2, 3, 3 4, 4. OK, so what I want is this. Now, A is going to be something by 4. How do I know that? Why can't this be any other number here? Yeah, I mean, it, how can this be in the kernel? The kernel's got to be uh, in Rm. Now, suppose I put a 1 there. So a 1 by 4 matrix with this kernel. Is it possible? Let's look at a 1 by 4 matrix. It looks like this. Bong, 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 bong. Four numbers. OK, what's the rank of such a matrix? One, two. Or 0. The rank could be 0 if the matrix is 0, 0, 0, 0. Otherwise, the rank is 1. So if the rank is 1, what's the, what's the dimension of the kernel? Well, by this theorem, if the rank is 1, the kernel has dimension 3. OK, because the total number of columns is 4. What do we need the kernel to have dimension? 2. That means that we cannot just have a rank of 1. The kernel has dimension 2. So nullity equals 2. This means that the rank has to equal 4 minus 2, which is 2. So we need a rank 2 matrix to make this work. We cannot have a rank 2 matrix, so there's none. OK, so how about 2 by 4? Well, there we might be able to do it. There we might be able to do it, because we just need a rank 2 matrix in 2 by 4. So this is not so easy, but we're going to try it. I need a 2 by 4 matrix that has rank 2 by this rank nullity theorem that kills those vectors precisely. Well, I'm going to write down a matrix in reduced row echelon form because this is the easiest thing to do with rank 2. So I'm not going to have 0, 0, 0, 0. By the way, if it looked like this, the rank would be at most 1. It could be 0 if the top row is also 0. But 1 is no good. So I need to have something like this. But then these can be anything. OK, so the basic idea is then to find a matrix with precisely a given kernel. I need to work out the dimension of the kernel as in the nullity. Well, it's just the number of vectors in the basis, assuming that this is a basis. And I haven't tricked you by having a linear combination of the others, a redundant vector. And then the rank, you just take the dimension as in the number of elements, 4, the number of uh, you know, elements in the, each vector, minus the nullity, which happens to also be 2. And then I'm looking for a, a matrix of exactly that rank. Now, by the way, if it said find a 3 by 4 matrix, the best thing to do be put all zeros down there, because you want the rank to be 2. OK, so. Anything bigger, I'm just going to sneakily put zeros in, and that's not going to change the term. But for a moment, let's deal with that. So then what I do is I find a matrix in reduced row echelon form that is as general as possible of that rank. 1, 0, A, B, in this case, 0, 1, C, D. 
and I now just use a brute force because I want this times 1015 to equal 0. So that is equal to 1 plus a plus 5b, and that's supposed to equal 0. Also, if I multiply this column, I get 0, so I just get c plus 5d, which is supposed to equal 0 as well. So I'm going to need to satisfy those equations. Also, the other vector has to be in the kernel as well. The other vector is 1, 2, 3, 4. So if I multiply this, I say we'll get 1 minus 2 plus 4 a plus 4b. It, well, and then the other column is going to be 2 plus 3c plus 4d. And that's supposed to be equal to 0 because it's supposed to be in the kernel. So if this, if this matrix has this vector in the kernel, then when I multiply that matrix by that vector, I should get 0, 0. That's the definition of the kernel. So I kind of have to solve these two things together. So actually, I've got four equations in four unknowns, but it's really just two pairs of two equations in two unknowns. So the first pair looks like this. a plus 5b equals minus 1. And the second pair is 3a plus 4b equals minus 1. And so if you work this out, then you can even write it as a matrix here. 1, 5, 3, 4, a, b equals minus 1, minus 1. And actually, the other two are nice. You have c plus 5d equals 0. That comes out of here. And you have 3c plus 4d is minus 2. In which case, the same matrix, 1, 5, 3, 4, times, a, uh, times cd is equal to 0 minus 2. Now, you could solve these by reduction, but actually the easiest thing to do is to take the inverse matrix. And so you'll find that AB is equal to the inverse of this matrix. And 2 by 2 is a very easy. Times minus 1 minus 1, which is equal to, first of all, the determinant is 4 minus 15, which is minus 1 11th. Then you switch these two, and you get 4, 1, and put minuses in front of these. Minus 5, 5, 3. Multiply that by minus 1, minus 1, and you get, I've run out of space. So it's quite tricky to find a matrix with exactly a specified kernel. But we're almost done. Let's just multiply this out. I get minus 1 eleventh times minus 4 plus 5 is 1, 3 minus 1 is 2. So try minus 1 eleventh minus 2 elevenths. So that's supposed to be AB. And as for CD, this is the same matrix inverse, 1, 5, 3, 4 inverse times the vector 0. And then times that vector. And if you do it, you just get t minus 10 elevenths and 2 elevenths. So that's CD. So this means that I can go back to my original matrix. So 1, 0, A, B, 0, 1, C, D. And I found all these variables. 1, 0, A is equal to minus 1 11th. B is minus 2 11th. C 
C is minus 10 elevenths and D is 2 elevenths. So these aren't particularly nice numbers, but I think I have found successfully vectors with exactly that kernel there. Yeah, so what I was saying is if you want to solve this, you could do an augmented matrix. But then you have to do it again. So, I mean, you'd have the same operations to reduce that, but then you have to sort of keep track of these two. Maybe it would be better actually to augment with both columns and, and do all of the operations there. And that, that's an alternative way. This inverse is pretty straightforward. Okay, so to find that that's the method, that is a method short of just scrounging around and being lucky and finding them. That's, that's a method of finding a matrix with a given kernel. Oh, of course, any multiple of that matrix will do, and there's plenty of other matrices that will do. In fact, you know, you could add this column, this row to this row, say, and put it in the first row. So you can do any of the operations that you do to get it into reduced row echelon form to undo that and get other matrices, all of which have the same kernel. Absolutely. Now, I want to point out one thing. This method that I've given you would not quite always work. Okay, here is a really simple example of where it would fail. Find a matrix whose kernel is precisely... this. Find A with kernel of A equals 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And you say, oh, well, we've been dimensioned the kernels too, so the rank has to be 2 as well by that theorem. And therefore, I'm going to look for a matrix like this. just like I did before. Now you multiply this by 1, 0, 0, 0, and you get 1, 0, 0, 0. Wait, that's supposed to be 0. Huh? What went wrong? Of course, any matrix of this form, 1, 0, 0, 0, cannot be in the kernel. What went wrong is that this is not the only possible rank 2 matrix. You have to allow yourselves the option of shoveling these ones back and forth. So maybe the one would have to be here, and this would have to be zero. In this particular case, the one cannot be in the first column because the first column itself is in the kernel. So the, the only possible matrix actually has zeros here, and then anything you like here. But in particular, that would be the re reduced form. So the only matrix with this precise form a kernel rather, which is within reduced row echelon form, is this. Although the answer to the question could have any matrix of this form. You could choose any four numbers here. And indeed, if you multiply it by 1, 0, 0, 0, you get 0. And 0, 1, 0, 0, you get 0. So what I'm just trying to say is don't be complacent. If you're going to follow this method and you work out the rank is 2, this is only one of the possibilities. What you would find is that you would get an inconsistent equation. If, if this didn't work, then this matrix here wouldn't have been invertible. And you would have had to scramble around and move this one over and maybe move this one. And just, There's no easy way to do it. Question. If B and C were multiples of A, or B and D were multiples of A and C, it wouldn't work, right? If B and C were uh, because then you wouldn't have a rank of two. Yes, you're quite right. Uh, any mat I said any matrix of this form would be good, but you are quite right, it's not. In, f in fact, if the matrix is just this, the zero matrix, then the kernel is not this. It's all of R4. So you and, and then along the lines of mine, what you're saying, so if you wrote this, also that's no good, because this has an extra kernel element, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, which is neither this nor this. That would be in the kernel. So you're right that you, you, the rank has to be 2. So it's not true what I said that any choice of A, B, C, and D. If, if all you were trying to do is find a matrix which sends these to 0, then you'd always just write down the 0 matrix, which sends everything to 0. 
but you want a matrix that only sends these two to zero. So you're quite right that you can't have this as a multiple of this. So the best thing would be to do exactly what I said, write down a reduced row echelon form, and then you know you can't be wrong. OK, uh, question, then a question, then we have to move on. Oh, if you can use eight variables and keep track of it, then yeah, you could probably find them, but it would be an absolute mess. You'd have to solve an eight-dimensional equation, right? Or two, four by four, yeah. And your question? Can you solve A for A, B, and C, and D? Yep. You don't have to combine everything into one big equation. No, it's two separate two-by-two two equations. You just need to find A, B, and yeah, and the C and D. They all, they all stay together. All right, I've got to move on. I've got to move on. I've shown you how to find a matrix with a given kernel, and it's not pretty. On the other hand, if the kernel is only one-dimensional, it can be a lot easier. But still, you still have to find a rank M minus 1 matrix. However, however, how about this? Find a matrix with a given image. So I want find A with image is the span, and I'll use the same vectors from before. 1, 0, 1, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, now what is the dimension of A? Which we know A is 4 by something. Why is it 4 by something? Because the image is n-dimensional, or it's, it's within Rn. So unlike the kernel where it was something by 4, if you want the image to have the vectors which are four-dimensional, well, it has to be 4 by something. But the question is, what something? Could it be 1? Why not? Why could you not have a 4 by 1 matrix, which now looks like this, 4 by 1? What's the rank of that matrix? 1 or 0? It cannot be more than one because you only have one column. And yet, I want the rank to be two. So I need at least two columns. That's no good. Well, fill those in. All you have to do is copy these vectors. Much easier. Yep, the rank of that matrix is 2. The image of that matrix is the span of the columns. Okay? Ah, okay. What if you want a 4 by 3 matrix? You could just repeat one of the columns if you really want to be lazy. Okay? Or you could um, multiply that column by 2. Who do we appreciate? Or, if you like, <laughs> you could add two of the columns. That's possible too. In fact, as long as one of the columns is a linear combination of the other two, you'll have the right image. Okay, but I think the easiest is just to copy them. What's another possibility? Oh, you just I just added these two. Yeah, you could put zeros. That's also good. Zero doesn't contribute to any span. No multiple of zero can actually help you get anywhere. So All right? Yep, as long as all the columns are linear combinations of these two vectors and they're not just the same linear combination, as in you need to get both of the vectors out of it, you'll be fine. What do you mean by the same? Well, I mean, I don't want to do this. Okay? They're all linear combinations of these two vectors, but this one kind of got left out. So you can't leave out either of them. Yeah, that's the, only the image of, of one dimension. That, that image is just that one vector, the span of that one vector. Okay, uh, question? I started a few minutes late, so I'm going to go a little late, but not much. Okay, so that's all I have to say about 3.3, .3, but those are pretty important types of questions. All right. Oh, no, that's not true. There's one more thing I have to say. But it leads on to 3.4 anyway. 
So I'm going to, it was in 3.3, but I'm going to pretend it's in 3.4 so I can say I started 3.4. Here goes. Okay, so we've, wor we've been working with subspaces of Rn, but the most important subspace of Rn is Rn itself. So take W, take W equals Rn. That's a subspace. Okay, one very, very obvious basis of Rn itself is the 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. Okay, so these are the vectors E1 through En. Okay, so these are N vectors which are linearly independent. They span all of Rn, so Rn is n-dimensional. Okay, that's good. Rn is n-dimensional. It has dimension n. But that means that any basis of Rn has n vectors in it. So, basis of Rn has n vectors. Again, if you have fewer than n vectors, they cannot span all of space, all of Rn. And if you have more than n vectors, then there must be at least one redundant vector that cannot be linearly independent. But if you have n vectors that are just right, it's a basis. So my question is this. How do you know, how can you tell if v1 up to vn are a basis, or is a basis, for rn? Well, you could take the matrix A, which is V1, Vn. It's an n by n matrix now. n by n. OK, so what do we need? What's the kernel of that matrix? It has to be 0. Because if it's not, then the columns are not linearly independent. They would be redundant vectors in the columns. Or alternatively, what is the rank of this? Well, it has to be all of n. Otherwise, they wouldn't span. You need these vectors to span all of Rn. So either way you look at it, the kernel of A must be 0. And the image of A must be all of Rn. In other words, either of these two are enough to say, i.e., A is invertible. This is another way of looking at invertible matrices, that columns form a basis of Rn. I don't really have time for questions at the moment. You can ask me afterwards. Sorry. OK? So what I'm trying to say is invertible matrices, another way of looking at them are, is, is the following. The kernel is 0. We already knew that. The image is all of Rn. Yes, of course, it's got to be, or else it's not, not invertible. You need to be able to find any vector. You need to be able to find Ax equals that vector. So the image has to be everything. But another way of interpreting these two equivalent things in n by n is that the columns form a basis. Now, that's not true if the matrix is not square. So everything I deal with in 3.4 will be to do with square matrices. OK? So this suggests the notion of coordinates. And I'm just going to start this, and you know I've got five more minutes that I'm giving myself. So here goes. Suppose I have a basis. I have a basis. V1 up to Vn of Rn. OK, it's a fact. Here is a fact. Every x in Rn can be written like this. x is some multiple of v1 plus some multiple of v2 plus some multiple of Vn in 
one and only one way, in exactly one way. Meaning there's no other choice of these constants, C1, C2, C3, up to Cn. There's no, there's no other way you can do it. Okay, why is that true? First, how do you know you can do it at all? Because these vectors span all of Rn, and x is in Rn, so some linear combination has to match x for any x. On the other hand, why is it only one way? Yeah, it's to do with the linear dependence. I mean, if you could do it another way, say, with d1 v1 plus d2 v2, if you could do it another way, and these are equal, you just subtract them. And you see, this is also x. This is just parenthetical. You take this away from this, and you see, this is just rough work, that 0 is c1 minus d1 v1 plus c2 minus d2 v2, and so on, up to cn minus dn vn. And so this linear combination equals 0. This means all these coefficients are 0. This must be 0. This must be 0 up to this. So that means c1 is d1, c2 is d2, d2, and all the coefficients must match. Everything must match. Therefore, this is the same as this. OK, don't worry if you didn't understand that proof. I really should have written it out, but this is a review session. It's not supposed to be proofs, but OK. So this suggests that we're going to call C1 up to Cn the coordinates of x with respect to the new basis. OK, so those are the coordinates of x with respect to the basis. Now, to put this in perspective, I'll show, it, I'll show you how it looks in two dimensions. Suppose my basis looks like this. Here's v1, and there's v2. OK, I am saying that if I take any vector x, I can write it as some multiple of v1 plus some multiple of v2. So how do I do that? Well. I sort of think of setting up a grid. So the horizontal lines are along v1, but with gap this distance given by v2's length there. Well, not really the length, but just batch distance. And then I do the same for v2. I, the vertical lines are like this. So x is down here. So this is going to tell me. OK, how many V2s do I need to go? Say, say it lands directly on this line here. I go minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. So this is minus 4 V2. And then I go V1, V1, and say half of V1. So this might be 2 and a half, or 5 halves V1. So x in these new coordinates would be equal to 5 halves V1 minus 4 V2. So the coordinates of x, whatever they were originally, are 5 halves comma minus 4. OK, so I've sort of changed my graph paper, as it were. I've made it all skew. And now I want to know, where is it on the new lines? I mean, it might have been, say, 3 comma minus 3 here, but that's irrelevant. What's relevant is how many v1s plus how many, many v2s you need to get together. OK? So to be more precise, I can take these coordinates c1 up to cn, and I can write them as a vector. And so I'm going to write the following notation. Let b, fancy b, be, that's a, a name for this basis. I need to give this a name. And I'm going to say that I've got some vector x, but I'm going to write x with brackets around it and with the subscript b. 
And I'm going to say that is C1, C2, up to Cn. So this means that co means the coordinates of x with respect to, that's WRT, the bases B are C1, C2, up to Cn, i.e., x equals C1, V1, plus C2, V2, up to Cn, Vn. So in my example up here, i.e., if B is the basis V1, V2, I would say just x with respect to this B is 5 halves minus 4. Okay, so this notation means these are not the regular coordinates of x. These are the coordinates of x with respect to this basis, i.e., x can be written as a linear combination of the basis with these coefficients. And then I'm going to finish with a matrix interpretation of this. And unfortunately, I cannot finish the section which shows you how to write linear transformations in terms of these bases, but I'll do it next time at the beginning. So what it comes down to is this. This, another way of saying that this vector is C1, C2 up to Cn, that's the same thing as saying the following. x is equal to s times c2 up to cn, where s is the matrix of columns, or whose columns are the basis vectors. Okay, why does that work? Because when you multiply this matrix by that vector, you get exactly the linear combination. Right? I mean, if you just plug that in there, you get this equation here. So just in f the final equation, just putting it all together, is that since that vector is given by xb, we have this really useful relation. And I'll just write out S again. OK, so this matrix, this equation tells you that if you know the coordinates of X with respect to B, you can find the coordinates of X, the regular old coordinates of X. And it has a cousin S inverse X. This is an equally important cousin. If you know the regular coordinates of x, you can find the coordinates with respect to this other basis by multiplying by the inverse of s. But then that's trickier because you actually have to invert the matrix s. And the reason you know you can invert s is because this is a basis, and s is invertible since v1 and vn are a basis. Okay, so I don't have any time obviously left. Thank you for bearing with me as I went a little over time. Next time I will show examples on that and finish the theory of 3.4, 5.1, 5.2, and then a complete review of the course. It's going to be a long night.